In this lecture, we'll talk about how risk estimation in the real world is very messy and how black swans can greatly impact risk estimates. This lecture will proceed in four parts. First, we'll talk about black swans, which are extreme events. And then we'll understand black swans as long tail events, so we'll characterize them statistically. Then we'll discuss the distinction between mediocristan and extremistan, that is, systems that have no black swans and systems that are dominated by black swans. And then we'll turn to a concept from the defense community called unknown unknowns. An idea underlying this discussion is that things that have never happened before happen all the time. I should say at the outset that this lecture is generally more abstract and the concepts are somewhat difficult to internalize because they're very deep. This is kind of similar to probability. When people first encounter probability, they have difficulty internalizing it. But when they do, it, they recognize that it's often essential for talking about uncertainty sensibly. While one doesn't use probability to compute conditional probabilities in one's head, one often uses the intuitions behind conditional probability in thinking about uncertainty frequently. So likewise, with talking about black swans, it provides a basic vocabulary for talking about extreme events. And while you're not computing long tail uh, calculations in your head frequently, it still can often end up structuring your thought. So hopefully this will help provide a background in thinking about extreme events more precisely. What exactly are black swans, these events that greatly impact risk analysis? Black swans can be understood as events that are outliers and outliers that also carry extreme impact. In the face of black swans, one might need to change one's conceptualization of reality or consider new variables or update one's previous system. Often how one was trying to respond to events has to change in the face of black swans too. They're so called because Europeans used to think that all swans were white, but then a single counterexample of a black swan found in Australia upended that understanding. This isn't to say that black swans are just corner cases though that can be kind of ignored as special cases that somebody can get around to and deal with and isn't the main part of the problem. Although they're often ignored by some people as outliers, they're very costly to ignore since they often dominate dynamics and matter more than many of the other events combined. Let's look at black swan events in a machine learning application, in this case, autonomous vehicles. Here are some events collected from Waymo. So some typical outlier events that tend to carry large impact and so could be construed as black swans would be these events. These are poor weather and lighting conditions. So in one case, there's a lot of snow, in one there's fog, and the other it's quite dark at night. More difficult examples include these. Here we have at the left a person holding a board and that's partly occluding them. In the middle, we're seeing some person's reflection. And at the right, there's a person riding a horse. This makes it more difficult for autonomous vehicles to function appropriately because there are very few instances like these that, that they've encountered before. It can also be difficult to generalize to the example at the left. In that example, there are people in costumes. So even though they don't look like people, they should be identified as such. In the middle, there are animals on the street which shouldn't be run over. And on the right, there's a green light, but the vehicle definitely shouldn't go because it will collide with the ambulance that's going across the street. Black swan events can sometimes be statistically characterized as long tail events. So people use them interchangeably occasionally. And people also sometimes use the word fat tails or heavy tails or thick tails to just describe long tails. And in this course, we'll just consistently use the phrase long tail. A tail of a distribution is the region that is far from the head or center of the distribution. So in this picture, at the left is the head of the distribution, and then there's a long tail. A long tail distribution have tails that taper off gradually rather than drop off sharply. This is what distinguishes them from many other distributions like Gaussian distributions. A key property of long tail distributions is that random variables x sub i from a long tail distribution are often max sum equivalent, which is to say that the largest events matter more than the other events combined. This is how an extreme observation can end up dominating di the dynamics 
and a single variable can matter more than everything else. Consequently, we're dealing with very extreme observations when we're talking about long tail distributions. Another important thing to know about long tail distributions is that they sometimes can make the usual arsenal of statistical tools become a lot less useful in practice. The mean, standard deviation, linear regression, principal components analysis, and so on are not robust to long tail data. Consequently, a lot of the machinery that we use to handle uncertainty breaks down in the face of long tails. An example long tail distribution is the power law distribution. So the probability density tapers off proportional to x to the negative alpha, where alpha is positive. We could look at how mean estimation behaves for long tail distributions compared to distributions such as Gaussians. So at the right is a, or excuse me, at the left is a high variance Gaussian distribution, and the mean converges very quickly in that setting. Meanwhile, we can see that a few single examples are greatly slowing down the convergence of the mean estimate. For some other distributions, the mean might require something like 10 trillion examples to estimate, which would make it very difficult to use in practice. For some other distributions, the mean doesn't even exist. And so for those long tail distributions, neither would the standard deviation exist. And so you can see how long tail distributions can occasionally make these tools break down entirely. So we can't just apply usual statistics or larger sample sizes when dealing with them because the larger sample sizes may not be enough to capture the mean, or they may just be infeasible to use in the real world. A concrete example of a long tail distribution is this power law distribution that approximates the website's degrees. So more popular websites have higher degrees. And as we can see, what happens when we zoom in to the tail of this distribution, the distribution ends up looking fairly similar. And if we zoom into the tail of this distribution again, it ends up having a similar structure to before. In this way, power law distributions are sometimes described as scale free. This is just one example of a long tail distribution. There are other long tail distributions like the power law distribution describing a Pareto 80-20 distribution where 80% of the land is owned by 20% of the people, or 80% of the user complaints on a website might come from 20% of the users. These are some other power law distributions. There are many real world long tail distributions. For example, word frequency follows a long tail distribution. So very common words like the are used substantially more than uncommon words such as macabre. Citations are also long tailed. So the most Highly cited papers end up taking up the lion's share of the citations compared to less cited papers. Web hits also follow a long tail distribution. People use Google almost all the time, whereas unpopular sites, if you add many of them together, sort of pale in comparison to the usage compared to the most popular ones. Natural phenomena, such as crater diameter, also follow long tail distributions. Likewise, solar flares have their peak intensity follow long tails. War intensity is long tail distributed too. So are the number of books sold. Telephone calls received is also long tailed. Earthquake magnitude, again, also long tail distribution. Net worth is long tail distributed. So the richest people have substantially more money than the poorest people in the world. That's an implication of it being long tail distributed. Name frequency is long tail distributed and even cities have long tail distributed populations. The most extreme part of long tail distributions can have an outsized effect in outcomes. For example, 0.1% of drugs generate about half of pharmaceutical industry sales. 0.2% of books account for 50% of sales. About 1% of bands earn 80% of all revenue from recorded music. In this way, we can see that long tail events are not just outliers that should be ignored from analysis, but are some of the most important and salient parts of the observations that we'll encounter. This isn't to suggest that all real world distributions are long tail distributions. In fact, many are often thin tailed. For example, exponential distributions happen a lot in reality, and they're thin tailed. Their probability density drops off exponentially fast. Here's a juxtaposition between a long tail distribution and an exponential distribution. 
they look fairly similar. But if we look at more extreme values, then we can see that long tail distributions put substantially more density on extreme events. And if we look at the densities on a log scale, we can see the exponential distributions probability decay exponentially, of course, and that there are orders of magnitude of difference between the density for extreme events. So in this way, extreme events are far more unlikely with exponential distributions. Gaussians have even thinner tails. Instead of their density following something like e to the negative x, the density follows e to the negative x squared. So they have even thinner tails than exponential distributions, and extremely large events are substantially more unlikely. Long tail events are not necessarily extremely likely, though. It's just to say that extreme long tail events are far more likely than extreme thin tail events. In trying to distinguish between whether a distribution is thin tailed or long tailed, ask yourself the question can I add a zero to it? If the answer is no, then that might suggest it's a thin tailed distribution. That's one possible heuristic to have in trying to guess what distribution a real event follows. There are many processes that give rise to long tail distributions. For example, if we multiply many variables together, that can give rise to long tail distributions. That's different from what the central limit theorem is saying, because the central limit theorem is talking about addition. The central limit theorem says that if you add together multiple random variables that are independent and subject to some basic regularity conditions, you get a thin-tailed Gaussian distribution. But we're talking about nonlinear interaction, not addition. An example of a multiplicative process that could give rise to long tail outcomes is as follows, and take it with a grain of salt, it's just to be suggested. If we have, or if we're trying to consider a researcher's impact, that could be a function of the amount of time that they spend researching, the number of GPUs that they have, the amount of drive they have, the number of good ideas, or the size of the research field that they're researching in. Those are all factors that could influence their ultimate impact. And ultimately, they interact nonlinearly, not really through an additive process. Not to say that it's exactly straight through multiplication, but there is a nonlinear interaction. And nonlinear interactions can arise when parts are connected or interdependent. We could see that if any of those variables would become zero, then the total research, then the total output would become zero. So, for example, in the research output example, if the amount of time a person has to research is zero, then they won't have any output. Or if they have no ideas to pursue, then they won't have any output. If they have no hardware to perform their experiments on, then likewise they also won't have any output. Those are some ways to see that this is not an addition of variables, where if one variable comes zero in an, in an additive process, it's not going to end up destroying the ultimate output. But in a nonlinear one, where there's multiplications, for instance, then a variable becoming zero can completely destroy the output. This is how you can distinguish whether you're dealing with variables being multiplied or whether they're being added. We've distinguished between thin tails and long tails. Another pedagogically useful distinction is between mediocristan and extremistan. So mediocristan is associated with thin tails. Extremistan is associated with long tails. Mediocristan is associated with the total being determined by many small events, whereas in extremistan, the total is determined by a few large events. In the first situation, a typical member is mediocre or average, and the notion of typical in extremistan really varies. Either they're one of the largest elements, or they're very small. In mediocristan, there's tyranny of the collective. The individual actions of an agent tend to get washed away in the collective action of many. Meanwhile, in extremistan, individual actions can greatly affect the dynamics. So there's tyranny of the accidental, or just a few. In mediocristan, the top few get a small slice, whereas in extremistan, the top few get a large share, like with book sales, as we saw. In mediocristan, it's generally easier to predict events, whereas in extremistan, since there are so few events that can wildly determine the outcomes. It makes prediction substantially harder. In mediocristan, the impact is non-scalable, 
but in extremistan, the impact can scale by many orders of magnitude. Mediocristan can be associated with mild randomness and extremistan, wild randomness. Consequently, it's important to know which environment one finds oneself in. Are we in mediocristan or are we in extremistan? Can we use typical statistical tools? And is the environment highly knowable or easier to predict? Or do we need to pay attention to more systemic factors and worry about a few events potentially subverting the entire system? This is an important question to ask yourself in performing risk analysis. Let's now try to distinguish between categories of uncertainty and unknowns. The simplest category is known knowns. These are things we are aware of and understand. It's associated with the phrase, we know what we know. It's associated with facts and requirements and can be accessed through recollection. Known unknowns are things we are aware of but don't understand completely. We know that we don't know these. For instance, I don't know what the weather is tomorrow. These are classic risks and involve conscious ignorance. They can often be understood better with closed-ended questions. Unknown knowns are things we understand but are not aware of. We don't know that we can know is a phrase it's associated with. Another phrase it's associated with is we can know more than we can tell. This involves unaccounted facts or tacit or implicit knowledge. And it's often arrived at through self-analysis. Finally, unknown unknowns are things we are not aware of nor understand. We don't know what we don't know. These are unknown risks and is associated with meta-ignorance, and these are encountered through open-ended exploration. These are some highly useful distinctions for talking about different types of unknowns, especially the distinction between meta-ignorance and conscious ignorance. How are all these concepts of black swans, unknown unknowns, and long tails associated? We'll review these now. Black swans are often statistically characterized by long tail distributions or they can cause long tail events. Because black swans can dominate risk analysis, we discuss long tails to characterize these highly impactful events statistically. And events regarded as black swans may be known unknowns to a few people who are in the know but they're typically unknown unknowns. So black swans are associated with long tails and black swans are typically associated with unknown unknowns. Let's close by discussing some relations between black swans and long-term safety. First is that AI's eventual impact on the world may be long tailed. Right now its economic effects are not that substantial, but eventually it could be shown to be quite the black swan and end up having a dominating effect on societal outcomes. Black swans are also relevant because in the future we want models that can detect black swans. And these black swans are more likely to arise in a future that is more rapidly changing and unexpectedly. So the importance of detecting black swans will be higher in the future because black swans may be more prevalent in the future. Additionally, if we have multiple AI agents deployed in the future, and if the social power or command over resources is more long-tailed, the collective will be less able to rein in the most powerful artificial agents. So consequently, extremistan is more relevant for thinking about future machine learning deployment dynamics. And finally, other existential risks can be viewed as just sufficiently extreme long tail events. For instance, bio risks in their sort of infection, infectiousness and their intensity can be thought as a long tail type of outcome or asteroids in their diameter. We saw that that followed a long tail. If the diameter is sufficiently large, that's enough to pose an existential risk. These are just some relations between black swans and extreme events and having a more precise understanding of longer term safety.